Hi grade nines. Okay, so we are finally back for our very, very last revision video, and this is on the last system, the reproductive system. Now, this system is slightly more complicated because we're going to be looking at both the male and the female reproductive system, which both, which both look very, very different. They've got tons of different physical properties, physical structures, um, the way that the systems work is very different. However, the end result, which is the production of gametes, is the same in both systems, and that's why we link it together under the reproductive system. Now, we know in our bodies we've got a whole bunch of different cells. We've got muscle, muscle cells, we've got bone marrow, or bone cells, sorry. We have got skin cells, epithelial cells. And each of these cells have got a very specific function. And when the function of the cell is for reproduction, when we use the cell to make new individuals, these cells are called gametes. So we have a male gamete and we have a female gamete. Now, the whole point of reproduction is to ensure that a species is able to continue, that new individuals are born every generation, that all the, um, the, the legacy and the history of a species that came before that individual is not just gone to waste. Um, as you can imagine, a species going through millions and millions of years of evolution, of changing, of hardships and trying to um, survive in an environment, and then finally the very last individual dies without being able to produce any offspring, and the, the species like, completely dies out. Um, how devastating that is, and we can see this during um, when we look at different species going extinct in the the fact we have to try and keep the biodiversity to try and keep animals from going extinct, um, they need to be able to reproduce. And so we've got two main types of reproduction. We've got asexual reproduction, which we won't, we won't be talking about right now. Um, you guys only need to know that later on in your biological career. Um, and then we have sexual reproduction. And what sexual reproduction is, is where you take the DNA from two separate um, animals. So you'll take the gamete, the sex cell from the male, and you'll take the gamete, the sex cell from the female. And those two... Um, those two cells containing the genetic information from the mother and the father respectively will mix together, they will fuse and they will form a new individual who has a very different genetic profile from his parents and he will be able to, um, he'll probably have an immune system that might be stronger than his parents or he might be more um, able to survive in certain situations, he may have certain physical properties that will be more advantageous for him as compared to his parents. So what those parents are doing and this doesn't matter if it's a buck, if it's a lion, if it's a human, what they are doing is they're trying to give their child the best possible chances of survival. They need to be able to have a good and healthy mate so that they have a good and healthy offspring. And this is very, very important for the continuation of species. So I've spoken about gametes being sex cells. I've spoken about the male sex cell and the female sex cell. And we're going to be looking at the proper scientific terminology for these sex cells. So when we look at the male, we have spermatozoa is the male sex cell. Now spermatozoa is a uh, plural. When we have an O-N at the end, a spermatozoan, that is a singular male gamete or a male sex cell. And for the female, we have ova. Again, ova is a plural. Um, the singular is ovum with a U-M. And this female sex cell, this female gamete, this ova is also known as what we call an egg cell or an egg. Okay. Um, spermatozoa, because it is such a long word, we normally just shorten it to sperm. So when we speak about sperm or spermatozoa or spermatozoan or the male gametes or the male sex cell, it all means the same thing. It's all just different ways of saying the same thing. Okay. Now, in order for any animal to be able to produce these gametes, their body needs to go through physical changes um, as well as hormonal changes so that these little gametes can be produced. So we call this time where all these physical and chemical changes are happening, we call this puberty. Now, we'll see changes, and if we look specifically at the humans, we see physical changes and hormonal changes um, being driven with the end goal to produce a male or a female who is physically viable to be able to produce offspring. So with the male, we see um, a deepening of the voices for the development of the testes, um, for the development of the penis in order for the reproduction um, to take place more successfully. We see increased bone density, we see increased muscle growth, and these are all traits that were traditionally seen as being advantageous in evolutionary history. So females would have seen these males as being able to support their children um, and therefore be viable mates, be, be mates that are going to be able to produce really healthy offspring. Okay, with the females, we see developments of the mammary glands, which is the characteristic that defines the whole um, group of mammals. So all mammals have mammary glands, and what those are, um, are those are special glands which produce a milk that is able to sustain the life of their offspring. So in females, we know the mammary glands as breasts, and what these breasts are able to do is produce a milk that will give their offspring all the health and nutrition that they need in their first few months of life. Okay, the female will also have increased fat deposits. Um, you'll see an increase in the body mass in the female. Generally, this is just because this fat will allow for um, 
if the woman tends to fall pregnant or if the woman falls pregnant, she will then be able to dig into these fat supplies to nourish her child. She will be able to get the energy. We know that fat is stored energy. So this extra energy can be used to help to maintain, help with the growth of this child because all the child's nutrients, all the child's growth, everything it needs, all its fuel comes from the mother. It needs to be fueled by the mother. So the mother needs to have the reserves that are able to sustain or sustain her child. Okay. Um, we will also see in females, we'll see like the widening of the hips. And this is obviously to physically accommodate the birthing process as well. Okay. So we now know the purpose of reproduction. We know what puberty is and we know we should all know what it is because I know we've covered it in life orientation as well. Okay, and we spoke about hormones. We're going to be looking at these hormones a little bit more in depth um, as we look at each individual reproductive system. So firstly, we're going to be looking at the male reproductive system. And the whole function of the male purpose, or the whole purpose of the male reproductive system is to produce the male sex cells, ensure that these sex cells are successfully transferred into the female, and to produce the sex hormone testosterone. So first, before we go into anything else, we're going to be looking at testosterone. So we're actually starting with this last bullet point. And the testosterone, which is produced in the testes, which is this region over here, this testosterone is responsible for the physical changes in the male, such as facial hair, increased pubic hair, deepening of the voice, and all those physical changes such as um, bone growth and muscle growth and things like that. Okay. Now, it may seem obvious that the purpose of the male reproductive system is to produce these sperm cells, these um, male gametes, but there's no point in the body going through all these processes if it's not able to deliver these little spermatozoan to the female ovum. And because of that, each species, um, the male has developed a penis, which is this external, um, which is this external region here, to perfectly fit with the female of the same species. So the male penis is developed in such a way that it best fits into the female vaginal cavity. And we'll see the same thing with um, different species. So the penis of a dog will be suited for the vagina of a dog. Um, same thing goes for whales, for lions, for whichever. Okay, so it ensures that. The body doesn't go through all this um, time and energy of producing these sex cells and then not actually having to, or not actually being able to successfully deposit these sex cells to produce a new offspring. Okay. So if we look at the diagram in, um, in detail, we'll start at the bottom with the testes. And the testes are two um, structures which are responsible for the production of the sperm cells, the spermatozoa, as well as the production of testosterone. Now, these testes only work at a certain temperature, they only function in certain environments, and they're quite, um, they're quite fussy, if you could say. So they, there's a very small temperature range that they actually um, function under so that proper, proper sperm cells will be able to be developed. And so to ensure that this is always the optimal temperature, to ensure that the testes are always able to produce sperm cells, there's this amazing structure on the outside, which is known as the scrotum. And the scrotum is a fleshy, um, basically fleshy sac-like structure and it's very elastic and what it has is it has the ability to either cool down or warm up the testes to ensure that that sperm is able to continue to be made all the time um, and it does that by either relaxing so the elastic the elasticity of um, the scrotum relaxes which allows the testes to move away from the body which helps it to cool down um, or if the body is really cold the scrotum will contract and will pull the testes up closer towards the warmth of the body temperature so that's a really amazing adaptation Leaving the testes, we have this long tube here, which we call the sperm duct. Now what happens is the sperm cells are produced in the testes, but the sperm cells will not be able to survive in the female vagina without a little bit of help. So what happens is along this tube, while the sperm cells are moving along this tube, the sperm duct, different fluids, different nutrients, different salts and minerals are being added, and this resultant mixture is what we call semen. So when the male ejaculates, he's ejaculating the substance that we know as semen, and the semen contains sperm, and it also contains liquids, fluids, um, salts, minerals, um, all these sorts of other components, will, which will ensure that the sperm will be able to reach the ovum in the ovaries. Okay. Now, the sperm duct eventually travels up to meet up with the urethra. So here we have the bladder, and we can see that in the male reproductive system, both the excretory system, so the urinary tract, and the reproductive system exit the body via the same opening or the same tube, which is the urethra. Here, just for context, we have the rectum. And as I've spoken about before, um, the penis is the physical anatomy on the outside of the body, which is used to transfer the sperm into the vagina. So that's actually quite straightforward. So testes, sperm duct, bladder, urethra, penis, and scrotum on the outside to protect the testes. Now, if we have a look at the male sex cell in a little bit more detail, so we're looking at our spermatozoa, and here we can see that individual spelling, spermatozoan. Let's just hold that up closer. Hopefully we can see. Okay, spermatozoan. 
Now, we all know that a cell has a nucleus, it has cytoplasm, it has um, a cell membrane, and all that sort of thing. And all that is contained in this little tiny region here of the sperm cell, which we know as the head of the sperm cell. Now, attached to the sperm cell head is this really amazing little structure that we call the tail. And in the past, we believed that this tail moved by beating like a whip, but recent studies have shown that it could possibly even move round and round like the propeller of a helicopter. And what this does is it allows the sperm cell to actually physically move through the female vagina towards the ovum, towards those ovaries, where it picks up a chemical trail. So they are chemically attracted to one another, the sperm cell and the ovum, um, which is, again, a really, really amazing adaptation. So if we go through the notes here, it says the male sex cell is called a sperm cell or a spermatozoan. The spermatozoa are formed in the testes. They travel through the sperm duct to mix with nutrients and fluid along the way before they are transferred into the female. This results in mixtures known as semen, which we've already spoken about. Sperm cells have a long tail, which has a whip-like action that enables them to swim. This head of the sperm cell contains all the genetic information from the father. So in this little head of the cell that I spoke about, all that DNA from the dad is held there. Moving on to the female reproductive system, and this one is a little bit more complicated. There are slightly more um, unfamiliar structures that we're going to be looking at. So firstly, we're looking at the function or the purpose of the female reproductive system. Obviously, it's to produce the female sex cell, which we call egg cells or ova. The singular there is the ovum. Um, it is also responsible for releasing the two female sex hormones. And these two hormones, as we have testosterone in the males, we have estrogen and progesterone in the female. Now, progesterone is responsible for um, the regulating the actual period. Um, or oh, sorry, reg regulating the actual pregnancy, not the period, regulating the actual pregnancy. So for those nine months that we know as gestation, the gestation period, um, that is all regulated by progesterone. And estrogen is responsible for the period, the menstruation. It's also responsible for um, all the physical developments of the female, female. So the breast development, the growth of pubic hair. Okay. And then, as we said, progesterone maintains pregnancy. So PR for PR, progesterone for pregnancy. Okay, not period. Period is controlled by estrogen. And the other role that the female reproductive system has is that it needs to be able to nourish and protect and grow the offspring inside it which again is something that is very, very unique to mammals, um, or we see it most commonly in mammals. If we look at birds or reptiles, they've all got eggs, fish have got eggs. There is far less parental care, but with mammals, we actually have the baby developing inside the female of our species. So there's very, very close contact constantly between the mother and the offspring. Okay, now looking at the physical features of the female reproductive system, we'll start at the bottom and this region here is known as the vaginal cavity. And this is the region that I said is so perfectly suited for the physical um, connection with the penis. So this is the region that the penis enters and this is where the semen is ejaculated into. So this vaginal cavity, which is also known as the birth canal, is where the semen is received. From there, the little sperm cells move through this muscular opening, and this muscular opening is known as the cervix. And usually this opening to the cervix is absolutely tiny. It's really, really, really small, small enough just for those tiny, tiny little sperm cell to move their way through. So the sperm cell move their way through up into, through the cervix, which is this very muscular, tiny little opening, and into this cavity here, which is called the uterus. And the uterus is actually the region where the baby will eventually implant and it will grow. Now what happens is in order to prepare for a baby, the uterus has got a very thick vascular lining. Now what that means is that there are lots and lots of blood vessels. And we know that blood is responsible for the transportation of oxygen, for the transportation of nutrients, to carry waste away from things. And so if we're having a new baby growing inside this female, she needs to have tons of surfaces that are able to provide that baby with oxygen because the baby itself can't breathe. The baby itself can't eat. So it needs to be able to have these vascular regions where we can easily give blood to the baby easily give these nutrients and pass the nutrients onto the baby. So anywhere that the egg implants needs to be able to have a surface that will later form into the umbilical cord that will pass on all these nutrients and carry away all the waste products from the baby. Okay. So every 28 days of the menstrual cycle, this lining thickens and prepares itself for the possibility of an egg being implanted. When the egg is not implanted, this lining of the uterus breaks away from the uterus wall and it leaves via the cervix and out through the vagina and this is what we know as menstruation or what we colloquially call as a female's period. So it is not actually blood that's being produced but rather the vascular um, epithelial tissue, epithelial being skin okay, or surface tissue um, that is being passed out by the female. Moving on from the uterus we have these two strange structures on either side 
and these tube areas are what we call fallopian tubes or oviducts. I will call them fallopian tubes. That is just what I'm more comfortable saying, which I'm more comfortable um, remembering. But oviducts, if you guys speak about an oviduct, that is perfectly correct as well. And these fallopian tubes or oviducts link to these very two, two very strange structures that we call the ovaries. Now, each of these ovaries are constantly producing eggs, are constantly producing ovum. And when I say constantly, what that means is every 28 days, an egg is released from each side. So one month it'll come from this side, the next month it'll come from the other side. It is very uncommon for two eggs to be released at a time, but when this does happen, that's when we get twins. And now we're getting non-identical twins because they are being, they are two separate eggs that are being um, fertilized. So what happens is these eggs are released from the ovaries. So the little ovum are released from the ovaries and they move into the fallopian tubes. Simultaneously, so at the same time, when the semen has been ejaculated into the vagina and the sperm or spermatozoa have traveled through the cervix and into the uterus, all the millions of the sperm cells will branch into both of these fallopian tubes. And if the one egg cell just happens to be on this side or just happens to be on that side, whichever side it's on, the first sperm cell to reach it will fuse and it will bond and it will create what we call a zygote. Okay, now this little zygote, this little fuse ball of uh, the egg and the sperm cell will move out of the fallopian tubes and it will implant itself onto that very vascular uterus wall that I spoke about. And from there, it will divide, it will grow, and it will eventually form um, into a new individual of that species. Okay, so if we have a look at the um, ovum in detail, the egg cell in detail, um, the egg cell of the ovum is produced by the ovaries. One ovum is released every 28 days, which in the process is known as ovulation. The ovum carries all the genetic information from the mother, which will then be passed on to the offspring if fertilization occurs. Menstruation is when, I've spoken about it already, if we just go through the notes very quickly, it says girls begin to release eggs as part of a monthly period known as the menstrual cycle, approximately once a month during ovulation, the ovary sends an ovum into one of the fallopian tubes. If it is not fertilized by any um, sperm cells, this little ovum will just dissolve, it will dissolve back into the, the uterus and all those dissolved substances in the uterus, the uterus lining will leave the body. Okay, this normally takes between three to five days. If we look at fertilization, and I just want to point out here to see that the, the size difference, which is really quite amazing, what we have there is the tiny, tiny, tiny little sperm cell, and this large round region here is the female's egg cell. So the sperm cell is much tinier than the, the egg cell. Okay, so during sexual intercourse, that is when the penis is inside the vagina, which we formally call um, copulation, The male places his erect penis inside the vagina. Now, when we're talking about an erect penis, what happens is this region of the male anatomy here, it has a lot of blood vessels. And what happens is when the male is sexually stimulated, when he's ready to reproduce, he these blood vessels become filled with blood. And basically, that props the penis up, which ensures it to be um, a lot firmer. And it stands, what we say, erect. So it stands more upright, in a more upright position. So this is the more relaxed position. And that the firmness of that penis will then ensure that it is perfectly able to fit inside the vagina. So that's what they're talking about when they say erect penis. Okay. Semen is then released into the vagina within a process known as ejaculation. The sperm cells swim up the vagina through the uterus towards the oviduct or fallopian tube. If there is an egg inside this um, oviduct or fallopian tube, the sperm cell will join it. It will fuse with it and it will fertilize the egg. And fertilization is known as the first stage of pregnancy. And finally, we will be looking at gestation, which is the actual process of, or the actual period of pregnancy. And we'll end off the section by looking at the problems associated with the reproductive system. Okay. Now, when that little male sex cell and the little female sex cell meet, we get what is called a zygote. And so here we can see the correct spelling of zygote. And a zygote means the egg has been fertilized. So zygote is a fertilized egg. It contains the genetic information from both the mom and the dad. And this little zygote, which initially started as just one sperm cell and just one egg cell, it divides and it divides and it divides. And it's, it has, this is where we call, it has all these like stem cells, which will then be able to develop into teeth and hair and skin and stomach and stomach lining and your liver and all these different types of organs that you have inside you um, to make up all those systems that we've already studied. Um, so it goes under this continuous cell division. So the cell is constantly dividing, dividing, dividing in one little ball um, to form what we call an embryo. The embryo will then finally implant against that very vascular uterus that I was talking about. So as it becomes attached to the uterus wall, we call this implantation. So the embryo has implanted on the uterus wall. The embryo will then develop into a fetus. And a fetus is what we call it when it has this more 
human or more adult look to it. You can actually see the type of little creature it's going to be turning into. Okay, it will remain in the uterus of a human for 40 weeks. In different animal species, there are different periods of gestation. That means the pregnancies last for different amounts of time. So I think if I'm not mistaken, elephants are, period, are um, pregnant for a period of about two years. So I think humans can be grateful that it's only nine months, if that's the case. Okay, um, so it will then develop into a baby, and this is known as pregnancy. The embryo, as I previously said, gets all its nutrients from the mother through the placenta and the umbilical cord. The placenta, which completely surrounds the baby, is responsible for allowing oxygen and nutrients from the mother's blood to diffuse into that offspring's blood, into the fetus's blood. Waste material from the baby is removed via the umbilical cord and will then be processed by the mother's kidneys and the mother's excretory system. Um, all right, contraception. What contraception is, is it is the prevention of the sperm cell from fertilizing the egg cell. And there are a number of ways we can do this. We'll look at the two main types. We'll look at chemical and we'll look at physical. So physical barriers are things that will stop the sperm cells physically, are things such as condoms, the male condom and the female condom. And that, what that will do is it will literally stop the sperm cell from reaching that egg cell. Another method is to take... Um, chemicals such as contraceptive pills and what these contraceptive pills do is they sort of trick the body into believing that it either does not need to release any new eggs or it makes the body produce more of a certain type of hormone which will um which will discourage implantation so the embryo or that little um zygote will not actually implant on the wall of the uterus so these are more chemical interference methods so pregnancy can be prevented using contraceptives such as the condom or the pill, but condoms have the added benefits of stopping things like HIV, AIDS, and other sexually transmitted diseases from reaching or from being swapped between partners. Okay, Now, the pill does not prevent these things. The pill still allows all these diseases to come in contact with the female, um, or it allows all the diseases that the female may have to become in contact with the male. So the pill is not, does not stop diseases. Now, health issues with the reproductive system, we're going to be looking at STDs and fetal alcohol syndrome. So an STD is any infection or disease that is passed on from one individual to the other during sexual intercourse. There are many different types of sexually transmitted diseases. One of the most common ones is HIV and AIDS. We all know about that. Um, you also get diseases such as syphilis, herpes, gonorrhea, etc. Now, it's important to remember that these are just the family names of diseases. So they speak about herpes, they're being spread by sexually transmitted diseases, but you get different types of herpes. And for example, um, one type of herpes that you can get um, on your mouth um, is a cold sore. And these literally have nothing to do with the sexually transmitted diseases. Cold sores can come from stress, they can come from other things. So it is in the family, in the same disease family, but it is not the same thing as the sexually transmitted disease. So a cold sore is not exactly the same thing. Um, some sexually transmitted diseases can actually result in the, in the human's reproductive system or the individual's reproductive system to stop working completely. So it can make that person become infertile. They cannot have a baby. So they will not be able, their reproductive system has been so damaged that they will not actually be able to support um, having a child. And the final, final point that we'll be going over, fetal alcohol syndrome, FAS, this occurs when the mother is consuming too much alcohol during the pregnancy. Now, we know alcohol is picked up by the body as a toxin, so the body identifies alcohol as a toxin. And when the mother is pregnant, she needs to put in as many good nutrients and good things in her, into her body as possible. So if she's consuming these toxins of that come with the alcohol, it is going to be really a very bad influence on the development of the child. So the child will have very characteristic deformities. Um, it will have a dis, uh, deformed face. It will have deformed limbs, so that's your arms and legs. Um, it will have heart abnormalities, so the heart will not develop properly. And the fetus development is delayed, which means it, it takes a lot longer for the baby to develop properly because it's not getting all those healthy things that it should be getting. Right? And mental retardation, so that basically means that the brain is not fully developed at the time of birth, and the individual may have learning problems in the future. These things occur all because of what the mother was consuming during her pregnancy. And that is it. Complete sub biology section done and dusted for the entirety of grade nine. Well done, guys, and good luck for the exam.